Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. And today you can see I'm in the podcast studio and we are going to discuss an important IPC standard or rather a pair of standards that are related to thermal analysis. What I've been doing on the Altium website lately is creating some calculators and the calculator that I just recently created relates to temperature prediction in PCB traces carrying a certain amount of current. This is related to calculations based on two possible standards, and I think the story behind these standards is pretty interesting. We're gonna discuss those two standards today in this video, and I'm going to show you how these calculators work, and I'm gonna show you the online version of this calculator in Altium Designer. Make sure to hop onto Altium Designer and get your free trial and follow along. Let's go ahead and get started. So to get started, what are the IPC's thermal design standards? Well, to understand the thermal design standards specified by the IPC, we have to look at two specific standards. The first standard is actually a general design standard, and there is thermal design information contained within it, and that standard is IPC 2221. And I actually have a copy of that standard that we'll go through here in just a moment. This standard contains a formula that relates the expected temperature rise a trace or a rail could experience given a particular current that is running through it and given its trace size. So the trace thickness or the copper foil thickness and the trace width. It also contains a couple of charts relating these quantities. Then there's another standard IPC 2152, which we've actually discussed with a podcast guest, Mike Jopi, and we'll link to that podcast episode in the description. Now, this standard contains many different charts relating temperature, current, and trace size, similar to the charts defined in IPC 2221. So sometimes when people are asking for formulas around thermal analysis or predicting temperature rise in a PCB, they're generally referring to this formula in IPC 2221. However, the data in 2152 could be used to build a numerical model through regression. We'll show an example of one of those models that has been produced by another company later in this video. Let's dive into IPC 2221. Here I have IPC 2221 revision A open. I only have the revision A standard. I don't have the later standard. The specifications here for thermal management, I don't believe they've changed going into revision B. So this is a generic standard on printed circuit board design. This particular standard covers a lot of different areas. And in fact, you can see here in the left side of this PDF, there are several different areas that are covered here. And we've run through this before in the context of annular rings. Now, I actually have the full text of this standard. You can see here it's 124 pages. And IPC doesn't release these for free. You actually have to purchase these. And I'm happy to run through this uh, with everyone on this video. So here there's actually several subsets of the 2221 standard. And there are all of these different subsets here. So there's one for rigid, for flex, PCM CIA cards, HDI boards, and then multi-chip modules. As we scroll through here, eventually we will come down to these two sections here, section six, and then we actually need to look in one of the appendices to see some of the data and some of the results and commentary on thermal prediction with this standard. But if we go to section six and we scroll down just a little bit, we actually find that there is a formula that you could use to predict temperature rise in a rail given the rail's cross-sectional area and the current that you are supplying to that rail. That particular formula is right here. So this formula basically tells you the current that is going to produce a temperature rise of delta T for a given cross-sectional area. So basically, if you know the copper thickness and you know the width of the trace, then you know the cross-sectional area. This area is in square mils. And of course, this temperature rise is the rise above ambient in degree C. And then this K here is a constant. And so it depends if you're on outer layers or inner layers. So here's the two values, 0.048 and 0.024. This particular formula could be used to predict 
temperature rise in a trace as long as you know the area and the current that's being supplied to it. If we're talking about AC current, we'd actually be more interested in the RMS current, so the average, and you would want to look at the absolute value because of course negative and positive currents can both produce joule heating and then that would of course produce temperature rise. Now if we keep scrolling down through this standard, we also see that there's a set of charts that relate temperature rise to the cross-sectional area of a trace and the current that is being carried here through this trace. You can then essentially pick a current, you can specify a temperature rise limit. So just as an example here, let's say 30 degrees C, and that would require a cross-sectional area of about 350 mils squared. Then if we scroll down to here and we look at say what the conductor width would be in mils for one ounce copper, that would essentially be a quarter inch wide conductor. This is the standard that you can use to predict temperature rise just in the traces in a printed circuit board when you apply some current. So this is for external conductors. And then you see here we have another set of graphs here for internal conductors. This same graph here would apply to this particular graph here for internal conductors. When we talked to Mike Jopi, we were actually discussing with him the IPC 2152 standard and his remarks here about this particular standard, the 2221 standard and its thermal design guidelines, is that it creates some overestimation of the trace width that you would need in order to limit temperature rise below some value. So essentially what you're doing when you design a trace or a rail to carry a particular current in your PCB, you want to limit the temperature rise so that it doesn't rise too high. And then of course there's a risk of delamination or decomposition or some other problem, or of course heating up nearby components. And you wanna limit that, which is why we would then of course design the trace to be wider so that it has lower DC resistance. And then we would expect a lower power dissipation in that trace. Now let's take a look at Appendix B in this particular standard. So now let's look at Appendix B. In Appendix B, they've expanded on this quite a bit. And this is where they mention the upcoming IPC 2152 standard. And the intention of that standard was to do a bit more investigation in order to provide better predictions of temperature rise in conductors for given current and cross-sectional area values. Here, essentially, they're starting to admit that what they've determined in the 2221 standard is insufficient. And if you actually scroll down here and you look at some of these later charts, what you'll find here is that what they're doing is they're actually taking some of these example boards and materials and they're predicting the temperature rise for a given current and a fixed trace width. In this chart, you can already see that IPC has essentially admitted that their model that they have used to try and predict the temperature rise in traces essentially predicts an excessively large temperature rise. And here they write off the scale, meaning that essentially the predictions for these higher currents predict such high trace temperature increases that they don't even register on this graph. They're essentially huge. This leads to the overestimation of trace width in order to bring temperature down to a manageable or acceptable level. So I think this is really important because sometimes the discussion around trace heating and around thermal management and around controlling the temperature in your board focuses a little bit on what is the temperature rise in a trace. In fact, if you go back and you think about this and you look at some of the recommendations from IPC, you can see here that they're recommending that at times you go way too large with your trace sizing that you're going to try and use to control heat generation. So next, let's look at IPC 2152. So here I don't actually have the 2152 standard, but I was able to find online a working document from the IPC 2152 standard during its development. And this was actually, I believe, authored by Mike Jopi himself, our podcast guest. So you can see here, they actually have an invitation to send him all of the comments 
direct to his email address. And this was the intended standard for determining current carrying capacity in a printed circuit board. So of course, applicable in power electronics and, and several other systems. Now, as you scroll through this, you start to see, you know, they have this same kind of chart here that they're trying to use to relate temperature rise with cross-sectional area. And um, if you just keep scrolling, one thing that you'll see is that they actually intended to develop many more of these different charts. And they have a short list here down in section eight. So here in section eight, you can see they're even taking account of operation just in air versus operation in vacuum. And then of course, internal versus external traces, several different copper weights. And then of course, this would be based on polyamide boards, but they could do it for other board materials. And so this was the intent of 2152 was to gather a lot Lot more data to give a more complete picture of temperature rise in the conductors in a printed circuit board. I think it's a bit difficult to use the results in this standard because of course it's just a bunch of charts and it's difficult to generalize. But what I've actually done is I've used some of the work from another company, smps.us. I'm gonna to link to their page in the description. And they actually took the data in IPC 2152 and then they were able to build a numerical model that can be used to predict temperature temperature and current in a trace for a given cross section. So what I went ahead and did is took that, put it into a calculator application, and I'm gonna show you that right now. Okay, so I am inside of a blog article that details the IPC 2221 standard. And you can see here, I have an IPC 2221 based trace width calculator that is based on this formula. And then here I have another blog that looks at an IPC 2152 calculator that is based on this numerical model. So this numerical model was developed by these guys at smps.us. So as I said earlier, all I'll link to a page that describes this model and the standard in much more detail. So I've reproduced their interpolation formula here, and I've actually taken this and incorporated it into this calculator that actually applies a correction for the presence of a plane. This is a bit more accurate because it's based on quite a bit more data. And here we can actually now compare the two calculators and their results. So just as an example, let's take account of, let's say an external trace carrying 10 amps, and we wanna limit temperature rise to 20 degrees C, and we have one ounce copper weight. 2152 standard states that you will need to have a cross-sectional area of 256 square mils, or rather a rail width of 183 mils, so almost a quarter inch. Now, let's do the same thing here. Let's say we have 10 amps current, 20 degrees C temperature rise. We're gonna go with a 62 mil thickness with a plane, and the plane area, let's just say it's five square inches, and then the distance to the plane, Let's say it's a thinner outer layer and let's just go with eight mils just as an example. So we have an eight mil plane below a one ounce copper foil carrying 10 amps of current, limited temperature rise to 20 degrees C and we have 62 mil thickness. And so here, if we calculate the required rail width, here you can see we get a much thinner rail, 95.7 mil rail width. This is very important because if you were to just use 2221, you may be at risk of overestimating the trace width that you need to carry a particular current. Now, is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? I think it's okay to be a bit conservative at times. And I think this is a useful check. And what this shows is that essentially, if you're gonna use a rail width between this value and this value, you're probably going to be just fine carrying 10 amps of current and only experiencing this level of temperature rise above ambient. Now, because this was based on interpolation from the original data in the IPC 2152 standard, it hasn't been incorporated into Altium Designer. You could certainly incorporate this particular formula into Altium Designer. However, if you use a different regression model, you may get a different formula that relates the area and the applied current and the temperature rise. However, this particular formula is incorporated into Altium Designer. 
what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take a look at a particular example project that I have here in Altium Designer. And just as an example, let's take a look at the VBAT line. So here, if I select the VBAT line, you can actually access some results from the IPC 2221 calculator right here under the net information. So just make sure to click that show more button. It will then show you the result of a calculation for the maximum current that it can carry. And that is going to be given the total cross-sectional area of this trace. It is also assuming a temperature rise of 20 degrees C above ambient. So it's actually doing that calculation for you. Now, this is not the widest line. It's only 32 mil, but it's giving you a 2.5 amp current limit given a 20 degree C temperature rise. So it's a nice quick check just to ensure that you are using a sufficiently wide trace to carry the current that you need in your board. And then of course, if you need to modify that, you could just hit the tab key. It's going to select all of the traces that are part of that route. And then you could of course modify this and make it larger or smaller as needed. So why can't we get any more granular than this? It's of course due to the very complex nature of most PCBs. It's also because the standard is only looking at traces and conductors. It's actually not looking at components. So you could conceivably go through a circuit board and look at every component, use that component's thermal resistance in order to determine a temperature rise given its power dissipation value. And I've actually talked about that in the previous video on thermal resistance. We'll link to that in the description. The problem is that you probably won't get a very accurate result. And the reason is simply because of the, the complex nature of any PCB. So just going back into this project for just a moment, you know, if I were to take this and look at this in 3D, you can see that it is very complex. There's a lot of different components. There's a lot of traces everywhere. Some of them are carrying high current. Some of them aren't. There's internal planes and rails. If I flip this over, you can see here there's traces and stuff on the back. There's components on the back. It's just an intractable problem. If you're going to try and look at a board like this and try to predict what the temperature rise is analytically. And so for this reason, we often default to measurement or of course if you have the budget for some high power simulation programs you would go through and use a thermal solver. So does this mean you shouldn't try and predict what the temperature rise will be or try to figure out what an appropriate trace width limit is? Well, not necessarily. These two calculators are useful for really just getting a rough estimate for an order of magnitude of trace width that you would need in order to accommodate a specific current. So keep that in mind. Don't totally throw these standards by the wayside and make sure to use those calculators. We've got links in the description and you can access them online for free. Thanks for watching everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video and of course make sure to subscribe. You'll be able to keep up with all of our tutorials and informational videos. And of course hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section and last but not least don't forget to call your fabricator folks.